the first talk of this session will be given by Paul Skrzypczyk from the University of Bristol. And he's going to be talking about linking resource quantifiers and operational tasks in quantum information theory. Paul, there you go. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, so yeah, this is a, I'm going to talk about a pair of papers uh, from the last couple of years. Um, first one with Noah Linden um, and then a, a, where this led to with my student, Andres Duquara. And I give both the references here. Um, so I focus mostly on one resource theory, a particularly simple one uh, called uh, measurement informativeness. And I'll explain what this is in a minute. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about, you know, in the, within this resource theory framework mindset, how, I mean, what would be some good quantifiers? And, you know, we have lots of lots of history in this direction. So we're going to take a couple of obvious routes, uh, robustness and, and weight. Uh, and the main thing is to focus on the operational significance of these quantifiers. So this is really what I, I find most interesting. Um, and this is what I'll spend most of my time talking about. And then very briefly at the end, I'll just discuss how you can also, I mean, in order to find these operational significance, we'll see that it leads us to complete sets of monotones uh, for a task of, called measurement simulation, again, which is something which has appeared in the literature for a little while now, and is pretty intuitive. Um, so I'll explain that. And then I'll briefly discuss at the end, depending on how much time I have, just uh, where this might go. So now in, for more general resource theories and what I'm talking about, so we do know some more, um, and you know where I see this, this research going in the future. Okay, so let's start off with a, a resource theory of measurement informativeness. <clears throat> and so the basic question, you know, it's a, one of the simplest questions you can ask, uh, about a measurement, I guess I would say, and it's not a new question at all. It's an old question. Is you know, if I have a measuring device, so you know, formally, a, you know, some some box which is specified by a collection of say just POVM. So I'll I'll assume a destructive measurement in this talk. So I'm I don't care about the post measurement state. You know, with some number of outcomes O and giving me probabilities according to the Born rule. I want to know how much you know how informative is that measurement? How much is it telling me about the the quantum state which I'm measuring? Right. That, that's the basic question we're interested in. Uh, and we want to see if it makes sense or how useful it is to take a resource theory approach. Of course, this is very fashionable at the minute. And so why, why not have a go and see if we, we learn something with this approach? And so the the resource then will be somehow the informativeness. Uh, I mean, a in, an informative measurement. So the measurement is then viewed as the resource. This will be a resource theory in the of measurements rather than states. Um, and, you know, we need to define uh, a free object. So whenever we have a resource theory, we need the resource, we need something free. So that will be some measurement which is going to be uninformative. And so we'll start here in a second to define what, what does this mean? What does it mean for a measurement to you know, give me no information about the quantum state it's measuring? Um, and typically, we would also want some operations. So some way of transforming the objects in the theory. And there's a natural set here, which would be measurement simulation, which I'll explain in a second. Um, OK, so let's start with the free object. It's easiest to start here. So what would it mean for a quantum state, to, for a measurement to give me no information about the quantum state? Well, a little thought and shows that it this is achieved if you have all of your peer of the elements being proportional to the identity operator. And because I want these to be positive and some to the identity, it basically means that I have a probability distribution, which I'm calling Q, uh, you know, a set of probabilities. And why is this uninformative? Um, well, if you have a think about it, you know, if I take this measurement and I measure any quantum state rho, what is the probability that I see the outcome A? Well, it's just Q of A, right? And that in particular is independent of rho. So, you know, it's, I'm really not doing a measurement here, right? This is just like encoding a random variable into a POVM and calling it a measurement and then realizing that that measurement doesn't tell me anything about the underlying quantum state. So it's kind of very natural class of uninformative uh, objects here. Um, so yeah, we can think about this as being the, the no measurement, if you like. So that's the that's then the free object in the theory, um, much like a separable state in entanglement theory. And so then what's going to be a resourceful object? Well, it's just the, you know, the the rest of the measurements, right? Is we always define the resourceful things by the by the converse. Um, and so any measurement which is not completely uninformative, so in other words, any measurement where the POVMs are not all equal proportional to the identity is going to give me some information about the state because it will have some dependence upon the quantum state in general, right? That that's the idea. Um, and so you know, the main question I would like to talk about today is how to quantify this informativeness. This is very qualitative so far, but we want to talk more quantitatively. Um, but before we do so, um, let's just first look at this idea of the operations, the allowed operations, because this will be very useful. Um, and so the 
you know, when, when we think of a resource theory in general, we have some idea that you, you, you have your object of interest and you want to transform it into another object of interest of the same type. And so what we naturally have for the for measurements would be a, a measurement simulation. So what might you want to do? So it's kind of summarized nicely by this picture. So you might have some shared randomness lambda um, and your particle comes in that you're going to measure. And before you measure it, you might apply some channel, right? So you might say pre-process uh, your quantum state, transform it in some way, and you might want to do this probabilistically in the most general setting. So there might be a, a lambda which tells you, you know, you condition upon to decide what to do. Then you might measure your, then you would use the, the resource you have, so the, the measurement device you have, you use it. And then finally, now what have you got? We've well, got the, the raw result of your measurement, and you've also got this, um, the shared randomness, and you might want to post-process classically into some new variable, random variable B. Right, so this fictitious measurement outcome, and uh, you, know, you probably would want to think about this as a function, but maybe you want to also inject even more randomness into the process at this stage. And so, you know, the most general thing you could imagine is having a probability distribution. And so, altogether, you know, this is a device which takes in a quantum state and spits out a measurement result. So it's a, it's another measurement. So we've simulated a measurement n. Let's call it by using a measurement m. Um, you know, if you want to write down what are the POVM elements of this measurement n, well, you just use this picture and essentially in the Heisenberg representation, and, and this is what the POVM elements come out as. So this is going to be our allowed transformations in this uh, resource theory perspective of, of measurements informativeness, OK? Uh, and we'll use uh, you know, the, the usual notation for a partial order, and we'll say that if m can simulate n, then I'll say that you know, we use this kind of m is, is greater than n in this partial order. Um, so again, you, you, know, you can then think about which way you know, transforming one measurement into another one via this allowed operation. OK, so that was the, that's the framework. That's our resource theory. And now let's think about quantifiers of informativeness. Um, and as I said, so you know, maybe you want to think I've got two measurements and I would like to compare them. I'd like to say, well, you know, measurement M is more informative than measurement N, for example, or some, something of that kind. So that, that's, or, or to place a number, you know, what is the most, what's the most informative measurement that one could consider? What's the, we've already talked about the least informative, the, these types of questions. Um, and so we're going to follow some well-trodden uh, route here. I mean, going all the way back to the work of Dal and Tarek, I guess, for entanglement theory. Um, where we can think about the idea of a robustness. So in other words, how much noise do you need to add to a measurement uh, before it's, you know, the fact that it's informative is ruined. That's the analog of how much noise do I need to add to an entangled state before I, you know, I ruin all the entanglement in the state. Um, so we're going to, that's one kind of quantifier, which is, you know, is well studied and we can follow. Um, and the other one we could think of is kind of in the opposite direction uh, is, you know, how frequently do I need to use a resource? How frequently do I need to use an informative measurement? in order to say, simulate or reproduce another measurement. Um, and this is called the weight. And this goes back, say, in entanglement theory to the work of Levenstein and Sampera uh, with the best separable approximation or in non-locality, I think around the same time with uh, Elitza, Elitza, Popescu and, uh, and Rolik uh, looking at the non-local weight of a, of a quantum state. So again, we're gonna, let's look at these two and see how it translates for the resource theory of measurement informativeness. Okay, so let's start with the robustness. And so what's the basic idea? And so we're going to, instead of performing the measurement I care about M all of the time, let's imagine that with probability P, I perform that measurement. And now let's assume that with probability 1 minus P, I perform some noise measurement. And so just for the, say, experts in the room, this is really then a, a kind of generalized uh, robustness uh, of measurement. But just to save on, on words, I'm just going to call it the robustness for the minute. Um, and hopefully it's, this shouldn't cause any confusion. Um, and so the robustness of measurement then, uh, this quantifies, what we do is we kind of minimize over all the noise. So we say, we want to ask ourselves, what's the minimum amount of noise that I need to use in the worst case before the measurement becomes completely uninformative, right? This is the, in words, the basic idea. And so what would the equation be? So for mathematical reasons, we switch from probabilities P and one minus P to this uh, other representation, we use one over one plus R and, and R over one plus R. So that this kind of comes, as you'll see, ultimately for mathematical convenience, but it's just a reparameterization of our probabilities. Um, so this is what I said. So we use the, the measurement M with probability one over one plus R. We use another measurement N with probability R over one plus R. And we're gonna you know, mix this together until it becomes uninformative, right? And we said uninformative was when each of the POVM elements is proportional to the identity. 
and then we want to find, as I said, the, the worst case. So we're going to have the, you know, choose the noise such that I, I need to use uh, at least R over one plus R of, of noise, right? So this is our, our definition. Um, and so we can just have a, a couple of quick thoughts just to make sure this is sensible. So on the one hand, if the measurement really is uninformative, so in other words, if, if the POVM element already were of the form, you know, some probabilities times an identity operator, then clearly I can choose R is equal to zero and I, and I get this equation satisfied. So, I mean, the, the robustness is zero when the measurement is uninformative, this is, this is good. Um, and we'll see that this is the only case. So this is a property called faithfulness, which we'll, we'll come back to, uh, I'll mention again in a minute. So that's useful. Um, and the basic idea is that when the measurement is highly informative, this means that I'm gonna need lots and lots of noise in order to, to ruin the, its ability to tell me something about the state, right? So this is the, and um, this is kind of captured in this definition. Uh, it's useful to look at this geometrically. So geometrically, how would we do this as a kind of cartoon? Um, so we can think about the space of all measurements as this big orange egg. Um, and now there'll be a subset of uninformative measurements and it's actually a lower dimensional space because there's many fewer parameters in order to specify an uninformative measurement. So it's some, you know, I'm gonna represent it here as, as a line, but it, it's, it's a low dimensional subspace. Uh, and I've got my measurement M, which is my point of interest. And so what is the robustness? Well, what you do is you basically, you're kind of selecting a, a, a noisy measurement here N, which is gonna kind of sit on the other side of the uninformative set compared to your measurement of interest. And what you're doing is you're looking at this kind of optimal ratio, basically the, the length here L divided by the length here L. If you optimize this, this is geometrically what turns out to be the robustness. So you're kind of, it's how close am I, close I am relative to how far away is there a, a kind of a, a noisy measurement. This is the geometrically what it turns out to be. Okay, so that was a, a, a whirlpool, def, I mean, a, a quick definition of the robustness. And so now let's just look at the other extreme, which is the weight. And so, as I said, we want to consider these two extremes. And so now the weight, we do kind of the opposite. And we say with probability P, I'm going to perform some informative measurement N. And with probability one minus P, I'm gonna allow myself to perform an uninformative measurement, right? So I'm, I'm kind of mixing uh, to a useful thing and a useless thing. And what I would like to, what, what we call the weight is then the, you know, the weight on which I have to put the probability with which I have to use the, the, the resource, right? So obviously if I, the basic idea being is if, I've, if I'm trying to, if I think about a measurement and it's not that uh, informative, then I should get away with not needing to use an informative measurement most of the time. That, that's the kind of intuition behind this definition. Um, and so if you write it down, uh, now we don't do this weird switch with the reparameterization, so we just stick with the probabilities. So we take our, yeah, we mix our POVM elements for this unknown useful measurement, informative one. We mix this with the uninformative one and we demand that it should reproduce the POVM elements we have. And again, we're gonna minimize over all the different types of noise and we minimize over the, the, um, the weight. And just to say, we don't care which uninformative measurement we use here. This is also an important thing. We don't fix, say, to the maximally mixed state. Uh, maximally mixed measurement, we allow any uninformative measurement. And similarly to the robustness, um, it's pretty easy to see that if the measurement is uninformative, then the weight is zero. So the weight is capturing the need to use some resource. Um, and again, the intuition is that when it's highly informative, then we need to use the resource for measurement N uh, lots of the time. Um, so this is again what we have. And so how does it compare geometrically? Uh, so if we go back to our same picture with our same measurement uh, that we care about, M here, which is uh, resourceful, so now the decomposition is actually in the other direction. So kind of M now sits in the middle and I need to find a resourceful measurement N, which will sit say over here and a resourceless measurement uh, sitting over here. And now the, the weight is actually, it's this distance here L uh, relative to the whole line segment. So there's this line between the uninformative one and the uh, informative one. So it turns out geometrically, this is what the weight is. So these are the two different um, quantifiers. And you can see they're both kind of geometrical in nature and quantify in different ways the, the measurement. Okay, so let me just tell you a few properties of these. Um, just to, I mean, just to quickly just summarize, just to say that these are, are sensible quantifiers. So on the one hand, they're both faithful. So I told you that they're zero if the measurement is uninformative. And actually what you can show is that it's if and only if. So again, if the measurement is, is 
informative, then indeed you the robustness will be non-zero and the weight will be non-zero. So that that's useful. Um, second of all, they they they're convex, which is you know means if I flip a coin and I I, do, I have two measurements and I flip a coin and I forget which one I perform, that's not going to make me think that I have more resource in my measurement. So that's very reasonable. Um, and then finally, uh, maybe the nicest one is that they're non-increasing under measurement simulation. So imagine now I give you, I use M to simulate a measurement N. Again, because I can use M to simulate it, I surely only need the resources in M at most in order to perform N. And indeed, this is what we see with these quantifiers. So the robustness can only go down and the weight can only go down under, under a simulation. So this is completely as we would expect it to be. So these are say kind of operational type uh, properties of these two quantifiers. Um, but also we have a calculational uh, um, property, which we all like, uh, which is that they can both be recast as semi-definite programs. And I'm sure I don't need to say too much about STPs to this audience, but you know this is our, our favorite type of optimization problem and it's nice that they can be recast and it means that we can you know, actually play with them and, and compute them in general. Um, and so a bit of playing around, redefining some variables. It's, the form is not too important. I'm just flashing it up in case anyone's interested, but we get the following uh, STP for the for one plus the robustness. It turns out this is naturally the natural quantity which arises when you write it in this way. And we get a kind of a nice similar mirror kind of definition for one minus the weight. And this is no coincidence. You'll, you'll see soon that, that the reason why we get this kind of nice symmetry. And so what's changed between these two definitions now when we write them as STPs, uh, we see it's actually the constraint which is flipped. And so the robustness is a minimization and I have a, a, a constraint on these kind of super normalized probabilities that they must be, that there's an operator inequality that QA times the identity must be greater than or equal to the POVM element. And when we come to the weight, now we're maximizing some numbers, uh, which are then subnormalized probabilities. Um, now we've got the upper bound, which says that this, you know, S tilde A times the identity has to be less than the, the, the POVM element. So these are the, these are the formulations we get. <clears throat> and so this, you know, it's nice when you've got them as STPs because now you know for, for certain that they're, you know, convex optimization problems that you kind of get for free, which is useful. Um, and as I said, this means they're easy to solve in practice uh, on the computer. Um, and also, and I'll use this a lot in this talk, but the, the main result for us actually comes through using this theory of duality. So every semi-definite program has a dual formulation, which is normally an equivalent formulation. And, and we're going to see that this is the, our key insight into saying something uh, operational about these quantifiers. <clears throat> so one final thing to say though is that actually once you've got to these semi-definite forms for the robustness and the weight, um, you actually can solve these optimization problems pretty easily um, once you just look at them and, and think for, for a couple of minutes if you're used to these things. So this is very special about the resource theory of measurement informativeness, I think. Um, in general, you can't solve these exactly, but in our case, we, we can. And so if you look at these, you know, when will this uh, constraint be satisfied? Well, it's satisfied when you set QA to be equal to the largest eigenvalue of the POVM element. Um, and so actually, once you notice this, you realize that the robustness is actually just the sum of all the largest eigenvalues. So we didn't start with this definition, but this is where, where we end up. Uh, and by kind of the nice symmetry is, is evident here is that when you look at one minus the weight, uh, it turns out that again, this constraint is saturated now when you take SA to be equal to the smallest eigenvalue of MA. And so now we find out that one minus the weight is actually just equal to the sum of the smallest eigenvalues. Um, so this is interesting. So it kind of shows that these geometrically defined properties uh, depend only upon the, I mean, kind of very small, you know, don't depend upon lots of structure of the POVMs, depends only upon the largest and smallest eigenvalues respectively, which is, which is nice to know. Um, and as I said, I think this wasn't so obvious from the original definition. So it's kind of nice that you just follow this pull on this thread and, and you get a kind of much simpler characterization in this direction. Okay, and so I, I want to give you oh, some... Can I just ask you something? Of course, of course. Uh, so in uh, like two, two or three slides ago, you, you showed this picture of a, of a convex set, which kind of represents all the measurements, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I guess this is for a fig, like measurements acting on a fixed dimension with a fixed number of outcomes. Yes, you're right. Yes, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Sorry. So I, 
at the patriarchy always happens that it, you know the number of outcomes are always fixed and the dimension is fixed yes and mm -hmm. if i want to change scenario i'll have to change uh, change the, the context set yes mm -hmm. okay and within that set the set of non-informative measurements is a is a convex subset right yep okay and so what are the um, what are the extremal points of that set and also what is the boundary of that set do you is there a simple characterization so for the, for the uninformative ones, it's no, no. I mean, yes, I guess for well, I guess kind of for both, but yeah, but also for the so entire for the uninformative ones. You, for the uninformative ones, it's pretty simple, right? Because you'll just get the probability. I mean, because these are probabilities, you'll get the the vertices will be the deterministic probability distributions mm -hmm. times by the identity operator. So you'll get some kind of simplex in that sense. Mm -hmm. and for the larger space, I mean, it's just a space of 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 you know, O outcome P of the ending dimension D. So I'm not sure if I can say much more than than that, but it, it is just a space of all measurements, right? Okay. Thanks. So I would like to give you a couple of examples in a second. I, I want to get to the question of what are the most uh, informative measurements according to these two measures. And so in order to do that, first, I just want to give you some bounds upon the, on the robustness and the weight. Um, and so the robustness, um, we know it's positive and what you can show is that the robustness cannot be larger than the the smaller of um the dimension or the number of outcomes minus one so in other words one plus a robustness is upper bounded by either the number of outcomes or the dimension um so this is reassuring because it says that you you know you can't get more and more informative by having lots and lots of outcomes in a fixed dimension so i can't 100 outcome measurement is in principle can't become very informative and it also says that if you're in high dimensions and you only have say two outcomes you'll you really have a bound on the how informative your measurement can be right so it's kind of it, it makes sense in both directions um so that's a bound for the robustness and for the weight i mean it's a bit more straightforward the weight was a probability between naught and one right it, it is a probability with which i need to do perform a resourceful measurement so it, it is bounded between naught and one so the, these are useful bounds which we we need to know Okay, and now let's think about what are the maximally resourceful measurements, right? And so are they what we would expect them to be? And so let's start off with uh, ideal rank one projective measurements, right? You know, the, the archetypal measurement. So I've got a set of, you know, projectors. Each of them has a maximum eigenvalue equal to one and a minimum eigenvalue equal to zero. And so the robustness, if you just plug it into my formula, it comes out to be D plus D minus one, which is maximal and the weight then comes out to be one because of all these zero eigenvalues. So according to both of these measures, these are maximally informative measurements, which is, I would say, is reassuring. Um, but you know, should these be the only maximally informative measurements? So I would say no, because we know things like informationally complete measurements exist, right? And they're not uh, ideal projective measurements. And so actually, if you look more generally at any rank one measurement, so you give me some, say, you know, O greater than D outcomes in dimension D. And so there'll be rank one and I'll need some num you know, positive number out the front in order for this to sum up to the identity. Um, so if you just plug it in, what you see is again, you get maximally robust and uh, maximal weight. And so again, these are both maximally informative, sorry, this measurement, these such measurements are maximally informative according to both of these measures. So that's also uh, reassuring. So is it the case that they always agree? Uh, and so they don't actually, and this is nice. And so the robustness is somehow, okay, let, let's have a look at the example. So the example where they don't agree is if you consider say rank D minus one measurements. So what do I mean by that? I mean, each of my POVM elements will be proportional to a projector and that projector will be a projector onto a D minus, D minus one dimensional space, right? <clears throat> and so now if you just plug it in, what you find is that the robustness is, becomes very small in high dimensions. It becomes almost zero, one over D minus one. Yet the weight, these are still maximally informative uh, with regards to the weight. So the weight would say these are still maximally informative measurements and the robustness would say that they're, they're not very informative at all. Um, so this, this one I would ask you to keep in your mind because this is the one we would like to understand a bit in a, with this operational interpretation. So why is it the case that these two you know, quantifiers come up to, with very, very different answers for this set of measurements? while they come up with the same answer in these two cases? And, and is this meaningful? And does it tell us something? Is it indicating there's something wrong about the weight? So I would argue not, um, but it, it was kind of a mystery that we wanted to understand here. Um, 
OK, and so this leads me nicely then into the operational significance uh, of these two quantifiers, right? So what, what is their meaning? I kind of defined them geometrically. What we'd really want is to say some think about some task where this quantifier is really telling me something meaningful about this task. That, that was our goal. Um, and so the, the task we're going to consider uh, in order to arrive at this operational significance is, is state discrimination, right? So just as a quick reminder, you know, what is state discrimination? So I have some source, some ensemble, uh, which produces, you know, states labeled by X, sigma X with probability distribution, some Q of X, right? And our goal in the state discrimination task, norm, I mean, there's a few different figures of merit you can consider, but, you know, generally what you want is to correctly identify which state was, was produced by the source, right? So which sigma X was, was sent to you. And so we can imagine playing this game, but now with a fixed measurement M, right? So I, I just, you know, you have what the ability to perform one measurement in your lab, uh, and you would like to say, well, I'm going to use this measurement in order to play this game. And I want to figure out how, you know, how well can I do, say, using my optimal strategy, using the measurement as smart as possible, how, how well can I do? And so what would you do? So in general, you might Think about the after it comes out, you might pre-process it in some way, maybe with some shared randomness. Um, then you might, then you're going to have to measure it at some point. You're going to have to measure it, and you'll get your outcome. And now, finally, you need to make a guess for which of the states was produced, so some g. And again, you might want to base your guess upon the outcome of the measurement on the shared randomness, because this, you know, was some transformation, and it might help you change your guess. So this is the say the the strategy uh, in the, in picture form here on the left. Uh, and the figure of merit we'll use is we'll use the the average guessing probability. So how well do you get this correct on average? So Q of X is a probability that the state sigma X is sent. And then what we would then ask for is what is the probability that you correctly guess G is equal to X when you know X was really the, the state which was emitted. And according to this picture, we can write down what is this probability distribution P of G given X. You know, it's just the it's exactly what this picture encodes. So it's just here. So if you cast your mind back to the beginning of the talk, uh, I introduced this notion of measurement simulation. And if you hopefully remember, this picture is very, you know, it's the same picture, right? So ultimately, there's a nicer way of expressing this is to say that we can actually maximize over all the measurements n, which can be simulated by m. Uh, and then we use n in order to, we, we assume that the outcome of our measurement is our guess for the for the state discrimination game. So it's just a slightly nicer way of writing this guessing probability. Okay, and so what we want to do is we want to compare how well I do in this task. This is, turns out this is a kind of a, an important step uh, to the case where I have a completely uninformative measurement. And more generally, what you want to compare to is say, uh, when you use a resource, which is you want to use a, a non-resource in your resource theory. This is the kind of the idea is that we're taking this resource theory perspective and we want to compare how well do I do with a fixed resource relative to how well do I do when, I, when I'm given something resourceless. Um, and so we, have, we assume we have no ability, you know, if I have an uninformative measurement, this is the same as saying I have no ability to measure my quantum state. This is the thing to keep in the back of our mind. And so now if I've got this state discrimination game where I'm getting the state sigma x with probability q of x, what's the optimal strategy to win this game on average as well as possible? Well, I should just guess the most probable state, right? If these states are not coming out uniformly at random, if one of the states is coming out 90% of the time, well, I better guess that state. And then that will be my optimal guessing strategy. So this is the, we call this the kind of the classical guessing strategy uh, in for this game when I, when I can't measure. Okay, and so then the question we ask ourselves is, how much bigger is my guessing probability when I have the ability to perform the measurement M and I perform the optimal guessing strategy using this measurement, how much bigger is it compared to the classical guessing probability for a given game E, right? So this is this somehow tells me about the, this, the, the ability of M to perform well in this game, uh, in the game specified by the ensemble E. And we can go a step further and we can actually say, well, then let's think about this ratio and let's think about all the games and let's ask ourselves what is the biggest that this ratio can possibly be. Right. And so it's kind of how, you know, how much of an advantage does M give me in this game? You know, when I think about playing over all games and what we were able to show uh, is that this is actually equal to one plus the robustness of the measurement. Right. So this gives us an, a way of understanding what is this number It's telling me the advantage I get by when I use M to play quantum state discrimination. Um, 
And so, yeah, this is exactly what I say here. So this is the, uh, the, the meaning that we find. <clears throat> and so indeed, you know, in all games, one plus a robustness is a bound which holds in, in all games E. So that, that's also a useful thing to know. Um, and so how do we prove this? Uh, so we do it in two steps. Uh, and so on the one hand, you can upper bound um, this ratio uh, by using the STP formulation for one plus a robustness. And in some senses, it's just easy. You, what I mean, you take this STP and you just uh, do a little bit of manipulation and you see that this drops out. I mean, very in a couple of lines, so that there's nothing sophisticated here. Um, and then how do you then show that it can be achieved? Well, this is where this duality comes in. As I said, the main tool for us was to use duality theory of STPs. And so it turns out that if you go to the dual STP, and I'll come to this in the next slide, from that, you can actually extract a game, an, an optimal game, say E star, uh, which actually then it, where the ratio is really equal to one plus R. And because we know this is the maximum, we get this equality. So this is the, the way we proceed. And so let's just remind ourselves, what is the duality of STP? So every semi-definite program, uh, has a dual formulation in terms of the you know, Lagrange multipliers of the problem, also called the dual variables. Um, and it's almost always the case that the dual is equivalent to the primal, which is to say in the jargon, this is called strong duality. Uh, you have to be very unlucky or you know, if strong duality doesn't hold in general. Um, so in all problems I know of, it's always the case that strong duality holds uh, um, if, you're, if you're careful. Um, so what is the, you know, if you apply this machinery, if you apply this duality theory, what do you get? What is this equivalent formulation of the STP? Uh, so it turns out it's the following. So you have to maximize this sum over A trace of MA rho A over some set of operators rho A. And well, rho A are positive operators and each of them is trace one. So indeed the dual variables are a set of quantum states. Um, so this is what we get for free. Um, and I'll just state it now for, for a second because we'll need it in a minute. But if you do the same duality theory for the weight, um, you get again something very, very similar. They, you know, there's a nice symmetry here and we get a minimization problem of the same functional and you again optimize over a set of quantum states. So both of them have a, a nice symmetry uh, in, in how they look. Um, and so, and it's easy to see that both problems satisfy this strong duality property. So this is easy to check uh, in general and, and it's, it's kind of manifest that it's satisfied, it's satisfied here. Um, and so, what do we then do? What once you use this duality, what do you do? So now the, the dual variables, so you know, we're thinking about playing state discrimination, and my optimization variables are naturally a set of quantum states. So, I mean, how would I then turn this into a game? Well, the, the trivial guess is to say, well, let's assume that the optimal dual variables, the variables which achieve this equality, let's take them to be the quantum states of the game. And given that it the, the STP doesn't give me a probability distribution, well, let me just take the you know the most trivial one I can think of. Let's take the uniform distribution. So let's assume that these states occur uniformly at random, and that is my game. And lo and behold, if you because of this strong because of this formulation here, if you make this guess and you you know you just sub it in, you'll see that you achieve in that game one plus r. So that this proves it for you. So it's kind of a nice application of duality to get an operational interpretation. Okay, so that was for the robustness. And so now let's try and do the same thing, but now for the weight. Um, and so for the weight, it turned out it was actually a bit more straightforward than we were expecting. So this is what I did with, with my student Andres. And we turned our attention to the task of state exclusion, which I guess is not as well known as state discrimination, but it's another task which has appeared in the literature. And so now it's very similar. So you've got a similar source that's spitting out state sigma x with probability q of x. Uh, but your goal now is to say avoid states. So when X comes out, you want to make a guess of G and you want G to be anything which is just not equal to X. So you're just trying to kind of exclude. Uh, so X is now telling you something you want to exclude. Uh, and so anything other than X would be a, a good answer. So I have a, say a silly reason, a silly example, if you want in the back of your mind, you know, cheesy action movie, where there's a bomb that's going to explode if you cut the blue wire. And if you cut any other wire except for the blue wire, then you're going to deactivate the bomb, right? And so sigma x is kind of your encoding of, of the wire that should not be cut, you know, telling you do not cut the blue wire. And so you'll, you know, you'll save the day and be the hero if you cut any other wire apart from the blue one. A um, bit more seriously, you know, why 
would you care about state exclusion? Well, this is the game which actually is at the heart of the PBR theorem, the pusey barrett rudolph theorem, proving that you know the quantum state cannot be interpreted statistically. Um, and this was kind of highlighted nicely in a paper by, by Jonathan Oppenheim and Chris Perry um, a couple of years afterwards, where they kind of, and then they studied uh, quantum state exclusion a bit more formally in that paper. So this was what we kind of had in the back of our mind. And so we, we wanted to have a, we thought, or we had some intuition that it might be good to look at this game. And so again, we're going to do the same thing. We want to kind of play optimally this game with a fixed measurement M. And so you'll do a similar, I mean, exactly the same type of processing as before, but you're just, your goal now is just to give out G different from X. And so now the, the key thing is to change our figure of merit. So instead of looking at the average probability that we succeed, it turns out it's really useful to look at the average probability of making a mistake. So what is the probability that you incorrectly uh, choose your guess G to be equal to X, which is what you don't want to achieve, right? So we look at this uh, error probability, and because now we want this to be, a, I mean, it's an error, so now we want this to be as small as possible. So this allows us to minimize now uh, a similar type of expression to before, and we're minimizing over all the measurements N that we can simulate using M. Um, and again, we want to compare this to the, the kind of the classical strategy where I, I don't have any resource. And so, you know, what's the converse for this game before we guess the most likely state? And so hopefully it's pretty obvious that now you should guess the least likely uh, X, right? If the game is not uniform, random, you should guess the least likely one, and that's your the best you can ever hope to achieve. And so now we do a similar thing. So we compare this error probability when we have access to the measurement M with the error probability um, when we have the, you know, without the measurement. And now we want to make this as small as possible. We'd like this error probability to go down when we have access to the measurement M. And so we minimize this over all games. And hopefully again, no surprises at this stage, we get that this is equal to one minus the weight. Um, so this again gives us now an operational way of understanding uh, this one minus the weight as being how well I can do in the in an optimally chosen uh, state exclusion game. Um, and the proof is identical in nature to the previous one. So the primal SDP again is gives us a kind of a simple lower bound, says that you will, uh, you know, you can never do better than one minus the weight in this minimization. And then the dual SDP, you extract the same game in the same way for the robustness and you get a um, uh, an exclusion game which where you achieve this equality. So that, that's how we did it. Okay, and so now we can just go back to our examples and, and actually understand this this anomaly, why, why the weight and the robustness disagreed for this D minus one measurement. So first of all, let's just quickly talk about the rank one measurement where it agreed, um, and let's just combine them all together so we can consider, say, O outcomes where O is either equal to D or greater than D, so it takes into account an ideal projective measurement and also the say more general information complete measurement. Um, and just to recall, what did we see before? Well, we saw before that one plus the robustness was D and that one minus the weight was zero. So this is what I showed you um, some slides ago. And so now what is the, the game we should play? Well, the game is the kind of the trivial, the obvious one. So, you know, these states, there will be O of them and they the measurement defines a set of states by just kind of taking the state in this rank one projector, uh, well, this rank one operator, let's mix them uniformly at random uh, and then what you find is that you know indeed you win this game the probability of winning with the with this measurement is is d over o so it's, it's one when this is a projective measurement and it's it goes down if you have more outcomes and the classical guessing probability is just one over o because all the states occur uniformly at random and so indeed the ratio is is equal to d as we would expect um, so that's kind of shows the meaning of, of this <clears throat> and so for the exclusion well, interestingly, now you can, you know, how else can you associate states to this measurement? Well, you can actually define very mixed states. So you can take, you know, a, a state which is rank D minus one. So some projector onto this subspace, you deform it at random, uh, and you'll still be able to exclude uh, these states uh, very easily using this measurement. And so you never make a mistake uh, when you have access to the measurement, whereas classically you would make a mistake in one over O of the time. And so again, because I've got a, a zero numerator over a non-zero denominator, then my, my ratio is zero. And so this is as I, I, I was hoping. So now let's look at the more interesting case with the rank D minus one measurements. Um, and so before we saw that, you know, one plus the robustness was, was this 
Uh, so then one plus for robustness turns out to be uh, very, very close to one, right? It's a little bit bigger than one and one minus the weight was still zero. So it's maximally informative with regards to the weight, but not very informative with regards to the robustness. And so again, what if we just extract the optimal games? So now we have to play this rank D minus one game. Um, and these states are very hard to distinguish, right? So they, they're not very orthogonal to each other in general. And so this is why this is, and this is still the best game that you can, this is still the game which is the makes best use of, of this measurement in order to to yeah, to differentiate at not having access to the measurement. And so if you put everything through, you get exactly as you would expect, the d over d minus one. So this one is kind of just shows that there is this game and you still get this disadvantage, even though these measurements are, you know, this is the best you can do, which is not very good. But the exclusion you can still do perfectly. So in particular, because you know you can now define a game with uh, pure states, um, which are orthogonal to the measurement directions. And so because they're of this orthogonality property, you can still exclude them perfectly. So you never make any mistakes uh, in the quantum setting, uh, whereas classically you still make mistakes one over, over the time. So this is this kind of nice thing. So because of the fact that this these operators still had a zero eigenvalue, they're still very good at playing exclusion games, even though they kind of not very good at playing uh, distinguish, you know, um, discrimination games. This is kind of the key insight as to why there is a sense in which it's meaningful to say that these measurements are, are maximally informative in, in some sense, because they this kind of exclusion information, they're still very good at, at telling you exclusion type information. Okay, so I just have a few more minutes. So I'm just gonna rush through uh, just a couple of slides here. So I just want to talk, go back to this idea of measurement simulation. So we, we said that this was our allowed transformation. And we, we said that, you know, M can simulate N if there's some measurement simulation. And so what is interesting is to find necessary and sufficient conditions, or in other words, a complete set of monotones, uh, which tell us, which are equivalent to the ability to M to simulate N, right? So this is this idea. And this is, again, not a new idea. It's been in, I guess, ever since entanglement theory, but in, in every resource theory, you can ask this similar type of questions. And so what do we find? Well, we find that if you think about all of the discrimination games and all of the exclusion games, and you think about these the success, these figures of merit, the guessing probability for an exclusion game and the error probability for, uh, for an exclusion, sorry, yeah, guessing probability for discrimination and error probability for exclusion, both of these uh, sets of numbers, if you vary over all games, actually individually com form complete sets of monotones. So in other words, uh, you know, M can simulate N if and only if for all discrimination games, I never do worse uh, in any game given access to M than I do with N, right? So that, that's nice. So the fact that, you know, one direction again is kind of trivial, is the fact that it's sufficient is, is the interesting direction here. It's kind of not so obvious why it should be sufficient in order to know that this guarantees the existence of a simulation protocol, but, but it does, so that's quite nice. Um, and similarly, you can do the same for exclusion. Just, you know, if the error probability is never worse, then, then you can, uh, then it guarantees the existence of a simulation. Um, and so, I mean, just one small thing, maybe for the, some people might, the experts in the room might be interested. So if you take minus the log uh, of both sides of these expressions, um, then actually what you get is you get some entropic type conditions. So you get the basically a kind of, which this looks like a, a conditional entropy type condition. So again, this appeared in the literature uh, in the last few years, thanks to uh, David Jennings and Francesco Buscemi in the kind of context of the resource theory of thermodynamics. Um, so we get very similar type of, of conditions here, uh, both for exclusion and for discrimination. So that I think is kind of, that, that's a good sign. It's an, it's an interesting consistency with other bits of the literature. Um, Okay, and then yeah, finally, just a couple of minutes on, on where does this go? So I've, I've talked all about this one particular, very simple resource theory. I think it helps be concrete and it kind of shows the ideas in a concrete fashion in a very simple scenario, but what, what can we say more generally? Um, so what I've kind of talked about, what we, the way that Andres and I in particular like to think about this is there's kind of, there's almost like a square. So we've got the, like a robustness quantifier. We've got this discrimination game. I very briefly just mentioned this idea of a complete set of monotones. And there's a fourth corner, which I haven't talked about at all, which is you can define a, a so-called kind of single shot uh, channel capacity. And if you consider the measurement as a quantum to classical channel, it turns out that this is also related here. So this is, okay, I won't talk about this, but it, it, it's in the paper if you're interested. Um, so this is what we saw uh, kind of with the robustness, and then there's this parallel set of connections for the, for the weight. So we get a similar square, but we the four corners are then the weight, 
exclusion games, you still have a complete set of monotones, and you can define a, a single shot capacity related to exclusion, so some kind of exclusion, exclusion type information. And so this was all for the resource theory of um, measurement informativeness. So how general is this kind of picture? Well, so I would say that we're kind of we have indications now. We have a bit of evidence that it's, it's relatively general. So, for example, this link between robustness and discrimination games. So we weren't the first to realize it. Um, I think the first case, I mean, Marco Piani was somehow the first one to realize this in, in a few instances in steering and in coherence and asymmetry. But with my other student, Patrick, we showed it holds for teleportation. We've also showed it holds for for Buscemi and measurement incompatibility. Um, you can show it holds for entanglement theory. There's also some very nice results by uh, Takaki and Ryuji uh, and Bartosz Reg Regular on, on more general scenarios. So th this link is kind of quite well established, I would say. Um, and there's lots of indications that there's uh, you know lots to say here. And also the work in, in Geneva by, by Rupi Urla. Um, and we, you know, it's not as well established, but lots of the links also seem to, to work at the back here. So we, we also seem to be pretty happy that, that this link up here is also uh, fine. Um, for the this discrimination to complete set of monotone, so I guess we haven't checked in all the cases, but as far as I can tell, in, in all the cases I've checked, it also seems to be pretty easy. So it also seems to work relatively generally. So that's quite a nice uh, link here. Um, the one which it seems to be the most difficult, as I mean, and this is kind of the, the stuff I'm working on at the minute, is, is understanding a bit better this single shot channel capacities. So it seems to work nicely for measurements, but for states, there seems to be some, some issues here, which I don't really understand yet, and, and we're trying to get to the bottom up. So that there's still kind of more to be understood in, in fleshing out this, this diagram more generally, but okay, it's nice to have something still to work on. Um, and then finally, so this is really my student, Andres, who's been uh, championing in this. But over this summer, we, we think now that we may have a, a nice way of, say, transitioning between the, this kind of front face and this back face. Um, and this makes a link, and we're hoping to put the paper on the archive and soon on, uh, on something called horse betting uh, with quantum side information uh, and risk aversion. So it, it's kind of a generalized set of games. Uh, and as you vary the amount of risk you're allowed to, you have in this kind of betting type scenario, we believe it really extrapolates between the, these two extremes. And so th this looks quite nice. And again, I think it might be hinting at something more general. So we're, we're keen to, to understand this uh, as, the, as the months go by. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. So let me just quickly conclude. Uh, so I spent most of my time kind of advocating this resource theory approach to measurement informativeness. And I hope to have convinced you that it's uh, an interesting way of looking at this old problem. Um, and these geometric quantifiers, uh, I think now it's nice to see that they have this operational significance. And you know, my view is that this was, at least for a long time, I never really understood the operational significance of kind of weight-based quantifiers. So I'm very happy that I now kind of understand a bit better what's going on here. Um, and this fact that they, that once you identify this operational significance, the games then give you necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, this again, I think, is a kind of a nice conceptually because you know the necessity was wasn't too difficult, but the fact that it's sufficient is really telling us something about the the, the underlying um, resource. I would say so that that's a really I think that's a, a nice result. Um, and then this four-way correspondence seems to hold uh, in you know lots of resource theories. Uh, and I would like to understand really, you know, is this is this some deep underlying structure or, or not here? You know, what, what really is the final message of this line of research? I think we're still trying to understand uh, exactly what, what we can say more generally from this. Um, and yeah, and, and look out in the next few months about our, our results on, on horse betting and risk aversion, which will hopefully try to bridge this gap and you might find it interest. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, Paul. Thanks for a uh, for a very nice talk. So, so actually, there are plenty of questions on the on the Discord platform. So, I will I will just ask you a few, and and then you know, let's see. Um, so, so the first questions that we had was about. Um, so, you introduced these two measures, which are essentially based on um, the maximum. Well, one of them turns out to be rel related to the maximum eigenvalue, and the other one is to the minimum eigenvalue of the operators. And the questions were, you know, have you considered things that depend on the entire spectrum of the operator? Um, some things in the middle. Yes, yeah, so I guess, I mean, yes and no, I guess this horse betting does depend, seems to depend more on, the, I mean, it, it's more related to then a kind of a Rennie parameter. And so I think it does relate to all of the eigenvalues. 
I guess we were, so far, we've really taken the approach of kind of define the thing operation, I mean, in some sense, and then arrive at it mathematically. And we haven't really focused so much on, say, starting up on the mathematical definition and going backwards. So I think it would be interesting to do this, but we, we haven't, the, the truth is we haven't done as much yet as we, we could have done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and the, and the related question. So, so um, these two measures, they are related to these, uh, you know, discrimination and exclusion games. Um, are there some games in the middle that you can consider, some partial exclusion or partial yeah. discrimination? So, yeah, this, this is, so there are, I mean, the natural thing in the middle is to somehow uh, say that you would, you know, one variant of exclusion is that you have to exclude, say, two uh, out of out of N. And mm -hmm. a natural generalization of discrimination is that you need to identify, you know, two or three out of, of N. And again, so we kind of started along this route, um, but we we didn't make too much progress. It, it feels like you kind of need to be, you, you maybe want a game where you get penalized for guess getting wrong and get kind of rewarded for guessing correctly. So I think this would be the most general scenario one could consider. Um, the truth is right now, we think that this horse betting is our is our best bet. So it's, it's a kind of a gambling type scenario where you're playing against a bookmaker and you're trying to you know win money and and it turns out that if you if you're kind of worried about how how much risk you're uh, putting yourself how much risk do you have of kind of losing all of your wealth then this uh is related to the a Rennie parameter so we, we kind of end up at Rennie I mean I put this plus or minus infinity on the in my notations and this is because the 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 robustness and the weight they kind of naturally are associated with the Rennie relative Rennie divergences of order um, alpha is plus infinity and alpha is minus infinity. And so we think we we can bridge the gap through the Rennie parameter alpha for all values of alpha. Now this is what we claim we can do, um, but there may be other ways of doing it. So I don't know if this is a unique way of bridging, and and it could just be that this is one sense in which there are two extreme cases, and there could be other kind of routes between the pair of them. Um, I, I'm kind of open to there being multiple ways of understanding this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, maybe one more question. Um, have you examined how your quantities relate to other attempts to quantify the lack of noise in a measurement? I'm thinking mainly of the noise operator and sharpness defined by Paul Terovich. So, I, I guess the, the brief answer is not yet. No, I, I haven't, but I, I'm, I mean, I, I'd be happy to discuss that and to try to do it, yeah. But, the, the truth is, I don't know the relation yet, but that's, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe maybe last more question. So, um, in the definition of simulability, you consider unitary operations. Uh, could you uh, put there like quantum channels rather than unitaries? I, yeah, I should I should have done this actually. Yeah, I, I wrote the slides, and then afterwards I realized I'd written U, and it should just be an arbitrary channel. Right. So any any trace preserving map will be fine. It, it yeah. So in in the in the Heisenberg kind of representation, of course, then it will be a unit or the, as long as the, you're, you're using the joint of a, of a trace preserving map. And so you just need a unit or map. So in other words, it's just going to map measurements to measurements. And so that will be fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So again, uh, Paul, thanks a lot for, for the talk. And if you have some time, I really encourage you to go on the discord because there is uh, there is quite a nice discussion there and, and your kind of your input is, is needed. Sure. So um, thanks a lot.